Hello, everybody. Reporting to you again from the Glamour City, Hollywood. 2017 and 2018 time frame, as electric vehicles were actually starting to become a real market, there was a very exciting lithium-ion battery market that was starting to take hold. And we were in a position where we could transfer a lot of the know-how and IP and innovation that we had developed over the course of time through the original DOE grant and through follow-on funding from DOE and DOD and NASA and the commercialization activity that we had both in oil and gas and sort of parallel markets like aerospace and defense. And we could transfer all that know-how into like a core innovation in lithium ion batteries, which, which is, which has become the elimination of really the most limiting material inside of the battery. And that's this PVDF binder. Um, we replaced that PVDF binder with a 3d carbon mesh. And it kind of has benefits all over the all over the battery and all over the system. If you love listening to this show, please consider giving a rating and a review on Amazon Alexa or wherever you listen. We want to continue bringing you this amazing content, and part of our ability to do that means that we need a big audience. Now, it may not seem like much, but rating and reviewing the show will help more people find us, just like how you found this show. Simply on any podcast platform, search for a show, scroll down to the bottom, and push five stars. It's that easy. Thanks for supporting the show. Today, I'm joined by Dr. John Cooley, founder and chief of product of Nanoramic Laboratories. Welcome to the show today. Thank you, Scott. Thanks for having me. So, John, you published in IEEE Transactions on Power Electronics, IEEE Transactions on Industrial Electronics, IET Transactions on Circuits, Devices, and Systems, and the Journal of Solid State Circuits, to name a few. Can you tell us about your journey from academic and research to commercialization? Yeah, absolutely. And there's a lot there, and maybe I'll have to give you a little bit of an abridged version. So it was, you know, I, I've always been fascinated by electronic systems, even as a kid. I thought it was just amazing that you could sort of cobble together electronic components and and make a system that did something that you wanted it to do. Um, and as, a, as an undergrad at MIT, um, I actually got two degrees there. I started as, as a physics major and, and added on electrical engineering, specifically circuits and electronics, because there's different brands of electrical engineering and computer science, especially at MIT. You can sort of have a software person or a hardware person or a mix. And I was really focused on hardware. Um, today, that's a little bit more unique than maybe it was 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Um, but that's really where my interests lie. And I stayed at MIT for 10 years because I finished my undergrad. And then I stayed in a, in a lab that I had been working in as an undergraduate, which was a power electronics focused lab. And I stayed there for grad school and I, I ended up completing a PhD um, um, as a, when I was there. Um, and my focus was really on power electronic systems, also sensing and instrumentation systems, but and, you know, electronics and, and hardware really. Um, as a grad student, as many sort of PhD students do, and as somebody with my personality does, I got restless sort of toward the end of my grad school uh, career. And I took a business class to kind of step out of my comfort zone. It was an MIT course called Energy Ventures. And that was about, um, you know, building a business plan for a clean energy technology uh, company. Uh, and that went well. And I kind of teamed up with somebody else in my lab. And this person who I teamed up with was a material scientist. So I was really a circuits and electronics guy teaming up with a material scientist. And that ultimately turned into a business plan competition, which was a clean energy prize. Um, and that ultimately then converted into a proposal to the DOE for a major funding award. Um, and this was the first open energy storage FOA from ARPA-E coming out of the recession. So in 2009, there was, which is when this was happening, there was a lot of money coming out um, of the, you know, coming out of the recession, out of the stimulus funding for clean energy technology development, kind of looking ahead to where we need to be um, as a society for addressing problems of climate change and other related problems. And we won five and a half million dollars just writing this grant proposal out of the basement of, of MIT in 2009. And to sort of address your question, you know, I had been a uh, circuits and electronics guy and I, and I still am. And so I sort of brought this sort of application thinking to the material science, which was the fundamental technology and sort of how do you connect that um, energy storage technology to um, 
that that energy storage technology to the end market. Um, and specifically, how do you design it into systems? So when we got started, I, you know, we noticed that, um, and there were cautionary tales around us about sort of having a high tech startup, you know, especially in the Boston ecosystem, and trying to immediately scale up a new technology. And there are reasons why that failed. I mean, for one thing, if you try to enter um, a very high volume, low margin market as a small company, you have a lot of a lot of headwinds um, to face. But secondly, those clean tech markets didn't really exist at the time, right? So we knew we needed an alpha market. And so pretty quickly, we identified the opposite market, which a lot of companies do, which is oil and gas drilling. And, and for the reasons that it's a very high price point, very low manufacturing volume market, if you can design yourself into it. And we did. We re-engineered our core technology device at, at the beginning was called a supercapacitor or an ultracapacitor. And that's what the DOE grant was funding um, us to develop. And we re-engineered supercaps to operate in um, harsh environments, and we deployed them in system-level products that I um, designed and developed and manufactured in oil and gas um, applications. And so I went pretty quickly from sort of writing this grant proposal out of the basement of MIT and winning that to deploying very high-tech, sophisticated power systems on oil rig floors myself personally in the field in Colorado and Texas. And that was a pretty interesting journey to kind of see, go from sort of academics and sort of the thought processes and skills that you learn there, um, you know, from, you know, um, to, to evaluate scientific problems, to solve engineering problems, um, to deploying, you know, harsh condition, power electronic and energy storage systems on oil rig floors in the desert. Um, And then, you know, I, I, you know, there was, there, as there are in the oil and gas industry, there are boom and bust cycles. And we had, start, we had we started to have a lot of real success in 2014 and 2015. And just as we were having that success, you might recall that there was a downturn in the oil market. And when that happens, your customers don't just sort of, you don't just sort of lose 10 or 20% in your sales volume, you, your customers actually go bankrupt. And so that caused us to sort of reevaluate where we had come and where we wanted to go. And, you know, the initial narr- narrative arc that we had developed had been to develop um, energy storage technology for clean tech applications, and it still was. Um, but we had gone pretty vertically integrated into oil and gas, developing not just the core energy storage technology that would suit that application, but then the power systems and applic- power systems for the application, manufacturing of those systems, and even field deployment. And so we kind of said, step back from that at that time, because we had a chance to and said, what do we really want to be? And we refocused down on energy storage technology itself mm-hmm. as the product. Um, and then about a year after that, we sort of refocused down even further on the advanced materials inside of the energy storage devices that enable those energy storage devices. So where we had started in ultra capacitors, which had become really a sort of a niche energy storage market. Now we, with our sort of broader focus on advanced materials, we had a much broader market opportunity to expand into other kinds of energy storage technologies. And that's kind of how, how we've come to be a, a lithium ion battery technology company because in the 2017 and 2018 timeframe, as electric vehicles were actually starting to become a real market, there was a very exciting lithium ion battery market that was starting to take hold. And we were in a position where we could transfer a lot of the know-how and IP and innovation that we had developed over the course of time through the original DOE grant and through follow-on funding from DOE and DOD and NASA and the commercialization activity that we had both in oil and gas and sort of parallel markets like aerospace and defense. And we could transfer all that know-how into like a core innovation in lithium ion batteries, which, which is, which has become the elimination of really the most limiting material inside of the battery. And that's this PVDF binder. Um, We replaced that PVDF binder with a 3d carbon mesh and it kind of has benefits all over the, all over the battery and all over the system. Um, so where I am today, you know, I think I started as a power electronics and electronic systems guy with a PhD and a lot of training in that area. Um, and I initially sort of brought the application thinking to, to what had started as a material science endeavor in energy storage. 
Um, and then through the, over the course of time, I've sort of learned a lot about not just applications and market and customer development, but also just business, how to run a business and build a business and how to strategically position that business. And ultimately, I think we've completed really our narrative arc of sort of starting with a clean tech aspiration, but commercializing first in an alpha market and then a beta market as well. You know, we had aerospace and defense and we still do. And then enjoying the benefits of, you know, culminating products in those markets and using the revenue from those markets to develop clean technology. And that's really where we are today. We're squarely into clean technology. So I am an electronics and hardware guy, kind of in a battery technology company. But at the end of the day, you know, a lot of the innovation that uh, really makes a big impact has to start from something that's very fundamental and challenging. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about it that way, you kind of have to drill down a little further into the science of the technology. Um, even if you understand the applications, you, you know, a lot of the real hard innovation is going to come from uh, step changes and sort of process and material innovations. And that's really what we've done. Agreed. Agreed. And, and as I'm listening, I'm, I'm very excited um, and because you're, you're talking about uh, almost like a case study, like a Harvard case study where uh, there are so many universities that are trying to crack this nut, right? Uh, whether it's CAIS, UCLA, I mean, you name it, every university that's not a Stanford, MIT, are trying to crack this nut of how do we take these really advanced IP research, all the papers that's being developed at a university level that is really at the forefront. Uh, but, you know, after the papers are published, then what happens? You know, we don't want it to just collect us, but that transition to commercialization is so much harder than people really understand. And I think, uh, you talked about, uh, again, in a very abbreviated version, uh, some of the ways that you kind of mitigated the risk, allow for some of the government, DOD fundings, NASA fundings, and others to come in to help mature some of those, found that alpha market uh, that you can actually apply and start to generate cash flow right away, uh, m- continue to mature and grow that portfolio so that you could have a you know portfolio of technologies, but also the IP that based on market changes, pivot to find essentially new market fit. Uh, That is so hard to do. It really is. And I I think, um, you know, and I think you bring up a really another point and and maybe because we're biased because we do focus on deep tech is that uh, there are lots of great ventures that are started by MBAs. And I I recognize that. And that's great because they understand market fit. They understand what the market needs. But to solve really difficult engineering problems, you have to start at the fundamental level, the science level. Uh, you got to solve that first, and 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 then of course make making sure you can actually execute upon that. Uh, so coming back to uh, what you guys are doing, uh, first of all, let's go ahead and introduce the company, uh, which is um, Nanoramic, and I believe the bigger problem that that we're talking about today is is the batteries, like you talked about uh, lithium ion, and specifically with lithium ion, the polymer binders they age, they break down uh, because of high temperature and voltage. And they lose that conductivity. So they need things like additives, for example. So because of some of these things, uh, it, it results in essentially low energy density. And then you got low performance around charging and discharging, which is essentially what a lot of EV owners like myself experience on a regular basis. So can you talk about how your technology fundamentally uh, gets rid of the polymer binders and primers? Uh, first, what are those and why do, why do those matter? And, and how you guys are really tackling it from a mature science in a different way. Yeah, that's right. And, and so at the end of the day, really what we're trying to do and what we have done is expand what we consider to be the cost performance frontier for lithium ion batteries. Um, sort of jumping ahead, you know, one of the key elegant points of our technology is that we do that without having to sort of start over on the manufacturing process. You see a lot of innovations that try to do this, but they're coming up with a radically different way to manufacture batteries, solid state or 3D printed batteries, things like that. And those are all noble pursuits and they may be successful, but I think our, our one of our key competitive advantages is that we have the ability we have the ability to rapidly commercialize because we're just reusing existing manufacturing infrastructure, but we have all of these benefits simultaneously on cost and performance. So, you know, you're right at its core what we do is we eliminate uh, high high molecular it's, it's called a high molecular weight polymer binder from the battery electrodes, both cathode and anode, which are the two key, which are the two electrodes inside of a lithium ion battery, cathode and anode. Um, that 
binder is typically PVDF, and it's really only there to serve one purpose, which is to sort of mechanically hold the sort of powders and the active layers together and to also hold them to the, foil, the current collector foil. Um, but it has all kinds of drawbacks. Um, you know, some of the drawbacks are, you know, no electrical conductivity. It's essentially a plastic inside of the uh, otherwise electrically conductive active layer. Um, it's not particularly electrochemically stable compared to some other materials. Um, it yields when it um, mechanically deforms like any sort of plastic would. So if you um, expand the electrode mechanically, which happens for certain types of electrodes, you fracture that binder system and permanently deform it. Um, but it's also a very difficult and limiting material for the manufacturing process. And this is where some of our key benefits come from, because we eliminate that material from the, manu from the battery and from the manufacturing process. Um, and in particular, there's a solvent that's required to dissolve this PVDF in the slurry. The slurry is sort of the paste that you um, paint onto the foil and then ultimately dry, and that becomes your battery electrode. So if you eliminate PVDF from that paste and you eliminate the this solvent, which is called NMP from the, uh, from that paste as well. Um, you, you can, you can relax your constraints on the rest of the process. Um, the NMP solvent has some drawbacks that are significant. One is that it's very unsafe and toxic. It's recognized, um, by the EPA as a hazardous uh, material and it has, uh, major safety handling and logistical drawbacks because of that. But it's also very difficult to evaporate. And one of the most, if not the most energy intensive step in the entire battery manufacturing process is the, is the drying or the evaporation process in the electrode coating step. Um, and so when we eliminate PVDF, we have all kinds of performance benefits because it also allows us to eliminate NMP and replace it with other solvents like water and ethanol or other alcohols. It also reduces the energy substantially required in the drying uh, step in, in, the in the electrode coating process. Um, our CTO likes to say, you can put our electrodes on the table and they just dry on their own, right? You can kind of watch it dry without even applying, even passing them through an oven. And, and that's true. And um, so what we see is that, you know, uh, there's, there's, there are a couple of plot holes that we want to cover in the transition from uh, internal combustion engines to electric vehicles, because what we're trying to do is, is reduce CO2 emissions globally. And one of those plot holes is that the battery manufacturing process is energy intensive. And if it's energy intensive, that means that you're producing carbon dioxide emissions. Um, so if we can target that energy uh, consumption in the manufacturing process and take a big piece out of it, that's a huge win. And that's what we do by eliminating NMP solvents. So we reduce the energy consumption from a battery manufacturing plant by 25% just by making this change. And to give you a sense of carbon dioxide emissions, that's about a half a million metric tons of carbon dioxide emissions reductions per year for each typical gigafactory. Um, so that's significant. Um, it, it's, it's huge. Yeah. It really is. It, yeah. And I, I wanted to uh, kind of go back. So for the, for the listeners, now they are understanding because you're not using PVDF as well as the NMP solvent, but fundamentally, uh, you guys are using nanomaterials or 3D carbon structure. Can you get into a little bit more of that and how you guys are able to um, really still be able to you know, hold these active uh, material particles together? Yeah, that's right. So the trick is not just getting rid of the PVDF, but yeah. replacing it with something that's even better. And a lot of what we learned in our um, you know, our original markets and engineering developments and innovations was about how to use uh, nanocarbons effectively in these kinds of products. Um, and when I say effectively, I mean sourcing widely available raw materials, um, using them in existing scalable manufacturing processes, um, addressing practical requirements like mechanical stability, bendability, windability, um, and perform, you know, performance, electrical conductivity, um, and electrochemical stability. And so we, we removed this PVDF binder, which has its, this role of mechanical um, adhesion and cohesion, um, and we replace it with what we call a 3D nanocarbon mesh. Um, so you can think of this as a sort of a carbon scaffold that self-assembles in the drying process. Um, and you know one of the advantages to that is that it's not only not an insulator, it's actually electrically conductive. 
It's also thermally conductive um, and it's also mechanically resilient. So when you, uh, if you, during the sort of usual cycling behavior of a lithium ion battery, if you mechanically expand or contract the electrode, um, this self, this uh, 3D carbon mesh actually sort of uh, uh, accommodates that expansion and contraction. And that's a major benefit for cycle life, especially for silicon anodes that we see in our own batteries. Um, and, and uh, you know, the real trick there or the elegance and where a lot of the work has gone into has been accomplishing that replacement of PVDF with a 3D nanocarbon mesh, but using conventional manufacturing techniques and, man and equipment. And that's, re that's really where we've succeeded and maybe perhaps others who have tried this have not. And I think that's a really interesting and a very important distinction and point that you make. And, and again, from a, from an investor point of view, it's very important because while there are some really transformational new processes that, that are going to be available, it also means that there's a significant capex and it hasn't been done before. And it's going to go through iterations before we get to a point where we can actually get that right and then to scale. So there is cost and time that's involved. Uh, and this elegant approach that you're talking about, it makes it possible so that you could, in fact, you know, do exactly what you said and let it dry on the table, so to speak, and use less carbon in doing so. Uh, so that makes it so much more doable, lowers the capex, lowers the opex, and then lowers the marginal cost of it as well, and it lowers the risk. Um, can you talk about, uh, you know, one of the issues with uh, lithium ion batteries, of course, is um, things catching on fire. Uh, and it has to do with, uh, with uh, being able to separate those cells so that uh, even if something were to go bad, uh, you can kind of isolate it. And the fact that these nanocarbons are able to accommodate and flex for the thermal and the heat and electrical and aspects, uh, how does that kind of mitigate some of the fire concerns? Yeah, there's a few ways um, that we mitigate some of those concerns. I mean, one of them is, is actually that the, uh, the nanocarbon mesh is, is thermally conductive. So um, one of the things that you watch out for in battery safety is thermal runaway. You, you want to keep the internal temperature of the battery below a certain threshold so that it doesn't start sort of an internal reaction that runs away. And because our um, electrodes are more thermally conductive, we dissipate heat that's generated internal from the cell out of the cell more efficiently. And we maintain an internal temperature that's lower. Um, also, because our electrodes are more electrically conductive, we just generate less heat inside of the cell. I mean, that's just the, the performance sort of parameter for that is that it's a higher power cell. It's more efficient. And so it can accommodate or handle more power. Um, and so we generate less heat. Um, one of the reasons that you see these sort of catastrophic failures in batteries uh, in, in particular is because of um, short circuits inside of the batteries. And there's a very popular tech technology, which is a lithium metal anode technology, lithium metal anode, meaning like a pure lithium metal um, anode on the anode side, instead of sort of an active layer on top of a, uh, a current collector, as we do today with sort of graphite anodes and silicon anodes. Um, and what I would say is, you know, uh, with that technology, one of the key drawbacks is that you grow these, these dendrites as you cycle the mm -hmm. battery and those dendrites can penetrate the separator and cause short circuits, which can cause some of these catastrophic failures. Um, so what I would say there is, you know, if we compare neocarbonics technology to lithium metal anode technology, there are some sort of um, advantages there because we can accomplish some of the same cost and, or if not all of the same cost and performance advantages of that technology. But we don't have those problems because we're using somewhat more conventional um, anode technology. Um, we're able to use what we call a silicon dominant anode. Um, so silicon is a very high capacity material that's used mostly as an additive in anodes today um, because it has a drawback that it mechanically expands when you charge the battery. Um, and that breaks down the anode and causes cycle life problems. Um, but because of our resilient um, 3D carbon mesh structure in the anode that we also use in the cathode. Uh, we don't have those cycle life problems with silicon. Mm -hmm. And so we're able to actually use a silicon dominant anode. Meaning mm -hmm. the silicon, silicon isn't an additive. It's actually the majority of the gotcha. active material. Gotcha. And that, that makes for a very high capacity anode. So we don't need a lithium metal anode approach to achieve a very high energy lithium ion battery. Um, and so we don't have these kinds of dendrite formation problems that you would have as a trade-off in lithium metal. And that's another way that we improve safety.
Super. Now let's talk about recycling. Uh, and that's going to become a huge issue because uh, right now I think so much of the focus is around just manufacturing creation to supply the demand for these batteries. But then we're going to have a huge recycling and end of life issue. Talk about how your batteries will be a lot easier to recycle and get back to use. Yeah. And, and this really, and this gets into supply chain and it even gets into ethical issues. How do you reduce the requirements on mining certain valuable raw materials to produce lithium ion batteries, especially, you know, lithium, but also additives in the, or components in the cathode, like co cobalt and nickel, nickel. Um, and sort of as this technology be starts to really work and get, you know, on the road and we see consumers buying electric vehicles, the industry is really turning towards some of these issues. Um, and they get, they get to some of the choices and selections about chemistry inside the battery, and they get to some very sort of important issues about product life cycle. Recycling is a part of that picture. And so if you can re if you can recapture the valuable materials from the battery at end of life, you can reduce how much is required to be mined to mm -hmm. produce new batteries. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and so, you know, one of the advantage, one of the advantages among the many advantages of our technology is that because we el eliminate PVDF from both cathode and anode, um, you, you don't need um, some of the sort of conventional or more difficult uh, techniques for recapturing those active materials from both from the, from the electrodes. You can use more conventional processes like um, water-based or alcohol-based solvent processes right. to re-extract re the, the materials. And so we think, you know, the technology is going to have advantages in end of life recycling um, among the other advantages on sort of what we consider to be eco-friendly or ethical advantages like uh, energy reduction and CO2 emissions yeah. reductions. Yeah. Uh, we sometimes uh, introduce uh, aspects of space. And the reason we introduce that aspect is because of the extremity, uh, because of the thermal conductive properties, for instance, if uh, we're talking talking about energy storage on the moon, for instance, where you have very wide ranging temperatures uh, because of the way that you have uh, half, half of the day in dark and half a day in light, for instance. And then of course, some part of the moon is completely dark. Um, how would storage work in space so that you could actually you know, support actual habitat and terraforming? That's interesting. So, um... So, so sort of using lithium ion batteries outside of electric vehicles, right. And space being a completely different application. Yeah. I mean, I think in space, it really depends. I, I, I would say that we've had some exposure to different aerospace and defense applications and including deep space missions and Venus missions for super cap technology. And it, it, there, there are some things to consider if you're in, um, you know, if you're actually in space and you're in a uh, very low pressure environment or a vacuum, you don't have the usual heat dissipation mm -hmm. um, pathways that you do on Earth. Um, and so you have to have, um, there are different design considerations there about dissipating heat and how you, uh, how efficient your energy storage and power systems are. Um, but, you know, if you were, if you're going to say, try to store energy for um, uh, day night cycle, um, from something like a solar array, you, um, need very long, what we call very long duration energy storage. Um, and, you know, as compared to sort of electric vehicles where, uh, the size and weight, and especially the size of the, um, batteries matters a lot for that sort of transport application, if you're in a stationary application, those those kinds of metrics don't matter quite as much. On a in a terrestrial situation where you're deploying energy storage, say for solar or wind support um, on the grid, really space and weight don't matter at all. It's really cost per unit energy capacity, and then total cycle life. In space, you have a kind of a different dimension because you have to get that technology into space. And so it's very expensive to do that. And so obviously weight is a very important factor, um, volume to some extent, but, but, but less important. Um, and so I think there are some interesting considerations there for sure. Um, and I, and I guess what I would say is, you know, all, all of the, all the advantages that we bring to lithium ion batteries, they, they persist or they pervade across different applications. Um, and, one thing that's notable is that the sort of change that we've made to the battery manufacturing 
um, the conventional battery manufacturing material set and manufacturing process, it, it applies to really any lithium ion battery chemistry. And so if there's a chemistry that works better for that application, for instance, LFP is considered to, to be, or is, is projected to be the dominant chemistry for um, stationary storage. You know, our technology works just as well for those kinds of chemistries as it does for sort of the leading technology in, in electric vehicles. Great to know. Uh, so we only have time for one more question. And the question for you is lessons learned. Any lessons from your past or current career that, that you can share with others? Lots of lessons learned. And there's there were a lot of dynamics and that sort of brief history that I ran through at the beginning. And I, um, say, I would say, you know, the people that you work with are really what matter the most to your success. Um, I found that, you know, I think that the people that we have in our company today are virtually a hundred percent aligned with our culture and they're great to work with. And that's, that's one of the things that makes it a great company. Um, and then being proactive and acting early. So, you know, and this applies to product development and it applies to business and management, but, um, getting ahead of getting ahead or over investing early in a process we see this a lot in product development. You really want to, um, sort of front load your, um, investment in how you're planning your equipment uh, and manufacturing scale up and how you're investing your human resources and the innovations that you're trying to accomplish early on in the process. Music to my ears. I love it. So today I have been joined by Dr. John Cooley, founder and chief of product at Nanoramic Laboratories. Thanks for joining today. Thank you very much, Scott. Thanks for having me. If you've enjoyed this episode, take a moment to rate our show on any podcast platform that you listen to. Scroll down to the bottom and push five stars. It's that easy. And as always, thanks for listening.